good one. Good. I'm, it's worked. Oh, hey, that sounds like I'm amplified. Wonderful. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here. I really want to thank the organizers. I think it's it's lovely to be part of this effort to bring uh, computational and experimental people together. So I'm going to talk about things that are very much echoing what we heard from all of the previous speakers uh, with an emphasis on prospection. Um, now, I like to start my talk with this slide just because it's fun to watch. And those of you who have seen me talk before have seen this before. But for if you don't recognize it, this is from the movie Ratatouille. So here's the food critic tasting the restaurant's Ratatouille, right? From a neuroscience perspective, this is a sensory experience. And it drives this amazing mental time travel back to his past where he remembers his childhood. You know, he has this rather, you know, obviously very strong experience of the way he feels, the way his house looks, all of these things coming back to him. And one of the things that's really important about this, of course, is that it happens unbelievably quickly. Right? And I think this is successful from an artistic perspective, from my, from my thought, just because we can all relate to this. Right? We've always all had this experience of having something just come back to us in a flash. But I also want to emphasize that the purpose of memory we assume from an evolutionary perspective is not that. Right? Reminiscing is probably not that adaptive. You know, it's actually a good way to get yourself eaten on, on this prairie. What's really useful is to the extent to which these memories allow you to make better decisions in the future. All right, and so I would say the entire purpose of memory, we think, from an evolutionary perspective, is to be able to use past experience to extrapolate accurately into the future so you can make good decisions. Right? Simple things like, oh, we went to a nice Vietnamese restaurant for lunch, we could go there again. Or, oh, I ate there and got food poisoning, stay away from it. Right? Similarly, you are all here largely, perhaps not exclusively, but largely to create memories. And if those of us here who are speaking to you fail to create memories in your heads, then we have failed at our duty. And if you fail to create memories, then this is a waste of your time. Right? And we do that because our hope is that by telling you scientific things or things, they will change the way you think and thereby change your behavior. All right, so from my perspective, that's sort of the whole point of these kinds of exercises at some level. And so we'd really like to all, I think all of us would like to understand how this works. So if we're looking for something that might constitute sort of a, an element or a, um, an event that reactivates in a memory in the brain, what should we look for? And so we can generate sort of some hypotheses about properties that it might have. The first of these is that it should be time compressed. All right? When I remembered what I did for lunch, I did not spend an hour reminiscing about standing in line for 15 minutes, ordering, and so on. Right? That would be completely useless. Memories are useful to the extent that they take long extended experiences and allow you to retrieve elements of them very, very quickly so that you can guide decisions. So if we're looking for this in the brain, ideally we might some want something that's time compressed. Also, this other issue is if we're right that the whole point of this is to be able to represent future possibilities or to be able to extrapolate into the future, then we really should be looking for a pattern of activity that's not just past, but also can be related to upcoming decisions. And then ideally, we'd like it to be related to those decisions. And we'd like to understand how do we go from a memory structure where we think about the past to a perspective structure where we're actually starting to think of things like planning and imagination. And can we come up with some coherent story about how all that might work? So we record in the hippocampus. I think you know, uh, you've seen lots of beautiful pictures from David and uh, you know, other speakers of this. This is uh, an example of hippocampal place cells. So hopefully this will just be fun to watch. But here we have a rat. You can't really see it, but this is a W-shaped track. This is the activity of 46 simultaneously recorded cells. And what you'll see in here, this is, by the way, 50% speed. So this is slowed down. You see these beautiful cells that are active in specific locations along the track. That activity is maintained when the animal's still. There's a subset of cells that continue to signal location when he's stopped. And then every once in a while, this activity is interrupted by one of these events. And that's a replay-like event, as David mentioned. And so what we're trying to understand at some level is how is it that we can relate this sort of observation of spiking activity to the functions of this circuit? Now, as many of you know who are in the hippocampal field, a lot of my work is parallel to David's work focusing on these sort of sharp wave ripple sequences. And I want to just touch on that briefly, because I, then I'm going to talk about something different, which is also parallel to what David is doing. So it's really a you know, two-part thing. So again, emphasize memories are presumably there to allow experience to influence upcoming decisions. And uh, you know, based on David's work and work in our lab, we've hypothesized that one role for these sharp wave ripple events, and David mentioned this in the question period, is to be able to plan. That is, to be able to generate trajectories that start where the animal is in representational space, move away from the animal, and therefore allow the animal, for example, to evaluate a value function. Should I go left? Should I go right? And that's, these sharp wave ripples really look like they contain activity that could do that. 
The problem is that prospection based on these events would be limited to behavioral states where these things are seen. And sharp wave ripples happen not completely exclusively, but almost exclusively when the animal isn't moving. All right? So if our hypothesis is that these guys are what's supporting the animal's ability to plan, then you get this sort of you know, uncomfortable situation where as soon as the animal starts trundling along, it loses its ability to think about the future. Right? That seems sort of unfortunate from a behavioral and evolutionary standpoint. So we want to ask, are there other forms of non-local activity that could inform decision-making processes? And indeed, there are another one. And here I'm going to borrow slides, well, not slides, but figures directly from David. But this is all work done by a postdoc in my lab, Kenny K. OK, so you've seen this before. Now I'm showing it again. So this is uh, from David's lab, a series of place cells. He showed you this earlier. And I'm stealing this, and I'm stealing more <laughs> figures from him because he's done a lot of the important work on sort of establishing this phenomena. So, uh, he didn't talk too much about this. This is the theta rhythm. So this is this 8 hertz modulation of activity that you see in the hippocampus when animals wander around. And what uh, they showed in this paper is what you get on each phase of this theta rhythm. And again, this is actually work from a number of labs, but David's pictures are the nicest, so I'm showing those. Is you get the animal's actual position in gray here, and you get spiking sequences. And we can do something which we might call decoding mental position, which is we can ask, based on the firing properties of where these cells are active, what does it look like the system is representing on each phase of this cycle? Okay? And it's been known for a long time, actually since 1996, when Bill Skaggs published this first, that later in the theta cycle, you get uh, spikes from cells that are further away from the animal. And so what it looks like on each cycle is this beautiful sweep of activity starting roughly where the animal is or a bit behind and sweeping out in front of the animal. Okay? And that's happening about eight times a second. So from this perspective, place cells aren't place cells. They're engaged in this sequence, which always has this little bit of sort of temporal motion to it. OK. And then again, just finishing this up from David's paper, you can see that these sequences actually go you know, sometimes as much as 50 or 60 centimeters into the future, if we sort of think of that representationally. But one of the questions has been, um, could these guys actually represent possibilities? Or is this just representing sort of maybe a motor plan, something the animal is going to do? We can ask, that for, as a starting point to that, if we look at spiking during these data sequences, does it fulfill some of the criteria that we're trying to get at for something that might involve something like memory? So the first point I want to make is it is time compressed. All right, And I'll just show you that again here. Each of these sequences, this is the real animal's motion. The slope of this line is clearly much steeper. right? And what's going on there is that it's taking something that occurs on a behavioral time scale from, you know, this is 1.5 seconds of running. And each of these little things is maybe two to four to six times faster than that. So this is a time compressed representation of some sort of movement through space. But is it capable of representing future possibilities? And this is really what we wanted to ask. Is there something in here that's more than just a deterministic, here I am, here's where I'm going? OK. So I need to tell you a little bit about the behavioral task we use to explain what we're doing here. So this is this W-shaped track. The animal has to learn from trial and error that the right sequence goes, say, from left to middle. Then it needs to remember when it's in the middle arm that it came from, sorry, yeah, that is your left, that's right. And then go to the right, right to middle, and then again remember in the middle arm that it needs to go to the left. So those outbound trials require memory of the previous choice, right? So we think of those as a period where planning is required. Um, and we'd like to understand what's going on when the animal comes up to this point and makes a decision. So just for reference, we're recording throughout the hippocampus here, but I'm focusing here. Uh, well, we're mostly looking at CA1, CA2, and CA3, but the regions don't matter that much except for, for one slide. OK. So let's ask, what do we expect to see based on sort of our canonical understanding of these events? So let's imagine we have an animal on a linear track here, and these are the representations of two place fields where these cells are active. So we might see firing patterns like this. The green cell would fire first, and then the blue cell. This is just standard place cell graphing. And if we then calculate the cross-correlation, that is where the spikes of the green cell fire come relative to the spikes of the blue cell, we'd see that they mostly come to the left. right? And that's just an instantiation of those two firing rate plots. Nothing interesting there. But we'd also see that on a short, shorter time scale, say about 500 milliseconds, there's this profound modulation based on the theta rhythm. And that's because on every cycle, while these two are overlapping, the green one will fire first. And then the blue one will tend to fire. Right? And it's not perfect, but that's generally true. And so this is a real cross-correlation, green, blue, green, blue, green, blue. And this is what is the sort of manifestation on a pairwise level of that broader sort of sequential decoding that D D David, from David's figures. OK, so this is what we expect to see. 
this is what we actually do see in some pairs of cells. All right, So this is a little complicated, but here's the theta rhythm. And I hope you can see this. These are the place fields of the cells. So this is a firing rate heat map representing where they're active in space on average. And this cell, as you see, is mostly active on right-hand trajectories. I'm sorry, these are both outbound. This one is mostly active on left-hand trajectories. Here, the animal is running up towards this choice point, And you see that this cell is firing on every other theta cycle. Right? Bump, pause, bump, pause. And this actually is similar to stuff that both Jim and Mike have shown in entorhinal cortex. But I don't think it's been documented in hippocampus. But correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe it has? Uh, yeah. Uh Keith has a figure, at least. OK, sorry, there is an O'Keefe figure on this. Uh, I should have put that up. I, that I didn't know. Thank you. OK, and what you see, what is, I think, particularly exciting to us, is that this red cell is firing on every other interleave cycle. So it's red, black, red, black, red, black. So this is one pass. This is the other pass. All right, so what we have now is possibly sort of an expansion of our representational capacity. Now, each cycle might have something different going on. Okay, so if we look at this and we just ask, what do we see in the cross correlations of these cells across all of the sort of 9,400 pairs of neurons that we have in our data set? About 66% of them, two thirds, do the canonical fire one then the other in every theta cycle thing. About 8% of them are perfectly anti-synchronous. All right, so they fire not at all together at time zero, but they fire quite often on every other cycle. About 16% of them are perfectly synchronous on every other cycle of theta. So when one fires, then the next, then they pause and fire together. And of course, everyone can do math. The ones that we're not showing here are kind of mixtures of these. So there's some intermediate cases. Um, and really, we think of this, this is a population level phenomena. So even looking at it in pairs isn't quite right. Nonetheless, I just want to show this to indicate that it might be related to behavior. Whoops, and my battery is dying. So uh, do we have another battery for this? Anyway, well, it's just buzzing at me. That would kind of imply there are only two frequencies, 8 hertz and 4 hertz. Yes. Um, pause that for a moment. So we'll, when we get to the end, we should talk about what this might mean for if this is related to decision making. Oh, thanks. OK. So until this dies. So this is a measure, again, adapted from both work from Jim's lab and Mike's lab, where we're just measuring on single cells how much do they tend to fire on every other cycle. This is not the best way to capture this, but the main point I want to say is that this is while the animal is moving. So it's not that the animal is looking back and forth or anything. It's in ballistic motion. And values of this theta skipping index greater than 0 indicate that it tends to fire more on every other cycle. And what you see is that when the choice is passed, there's a little bit of this. But when the choice is imminent, there's actually quite a lot more at both of these speeds. So when the animal is coming up to a bifurcation where it needs to think about it, we assume, we get more on a single cell level of this theta skipping, suggesting that it might be related to upcoming behavior or at least the representation of future possibilities. OK, great. So what about at the population level? Because that's where really this gets interesting is, is this really the circuit oscillating in some interesting way between you know, different representations? So what I'm showing you here, this is the track. This is sort of in flipped over M-shaped configuration. And the points here represent the animal in head direction, where the dot sort of points at the animal's head from its tail as it runs up and then smoothly goes to the right. This yellow area will be highlighted on the next screen. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask, are there representations during this period of either the left arm or the right arm? OK, so we're asking basically, is the animal thinking in some way about where it's going? And what is the temporal structure of that thought? Now, this is complicated, and I apologize in advance. There's a lot going on here, but let me just take you through it. On the bottom is the animal's speed and the animal's angular head speed. And the reason I'm showing you that is that there's work from um, particularly David Reddish's lab talking about vicarious trial and error, where the animal looks one way and looks the other. And he sort of explored how sequences might be generated there. And the point is just to say is this animal is not jiggling its head back and forth in any way that we can understand. And it's moving at quite high speed. So this is continuous smooth motion. This is the theta rhythm. This is that yellow period. And what we're using here is a clusterless decoding method that we developed with our colleague Uri Eden. The details don't matter for this, but the idea is we use all of the spikes we record, as well as where they occurred in space, to decode on a one millisecond basis the sort of instantaneous estimate of the population representation of position. Happy to talk about this in detail, but that's for questions. And so what you're seeing here, this is the animal's real position in green. This is the decoded estimate 
All right, and you see these nice sweeps forward, which is what we expect on each theta cycle. And then when they get, start getting close to this choice point, we see something kind of cool from my perspective. So this is representations of the right arm. This is representations of the left arm. So here it is. It goes up into the left. Next cycle, up into the right, left, right, left, right, left, and then it stays left. All right? So this is the system alternating at 8 hertz between what looks like representations of future possibilities until it seems to settle on one. And I will say, I had no idea the brain could do this. Um, I think it's kind of neat to think about, you know, as one makes one's own decisions about what routes to take in life, that something underlying like this might be going on. Here's another example. This is one where the animal is a little bit more still and its head is moving a little bit. And I'll just focus on this. This is, you know, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, and then right. All right? Um, this is hard to get by chance. Right? And you can imagine, I'll, I'll quantify it in a moment, but the main point is here, you know, here the animal is moving more slowly, but there looks like very, very clear systematic alternation. And I'll say there's nothing about alternation built into our decoding model. You know, it only sort of lives at a one millisecond time bin in terms of its state space transition. So we can quantify how likely is it that we would see this strength of alternation. And I can just focus you on this bottom plot. This is three cycles or more, so left, right, left. And the ones on the red here, this is negative log base 10 of the p-value. So these are the ones that are p less than 0.05. And 80% of the time where we see more than three cycles, it's more, less likely to occur than chance when we shuffle the order and resample it. And in particular, I just want to emphasize there's this huge bin out here, which is just incredibly like, unlikely. Right? So this is not happening all the time. But when it's happening, it seems extremely robust as far as we can tell. What's the fraction correct on these, on these things? Yeah. So uh, here we're probably in this part of the task. So this is across all in original learning and later. But we're probably averaging around 75, 80% correct. It's so kind of a hard task yeah, yeah. No, they really, they still have to think, which is, you know, they're not fully automated from the, from the perspective of perfect or, you know, 95% correct behavior. OK. The other thing I want to emphasize, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Supervised or unsupervised? Oh, the, 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 sorry. So the way the clusterless decoding works is for all the spikes that occur while the animal's in motion, we just collect them up. And so, sorry, briefly, we, we do this for each tetrode. So we have four signals. We create a four-dimensional amplitude space and a one-dimensional position space. And then for any spike we want to decode, we just look up its location in the 4D amplitude space and do a kernel smoother on the 1D position space. And that's where we say it is. So it's based on the real data. Um, but we're not using the data. I mean, it's based on the data. This gets complicated in terms of which data goes into it. But that's the basic way it's constructed. I hope that answers the question. OK. And then the point is here is most of these, or a large number of these, the black points in particular, are occurring during ballistic movement. All right. So we really thought that the animal was just you know, representing here I am, where I'm going. This really suggests that the stuff you know, like David and others have really been focusing on has this extra representational capacity of possibilities, which is very exciting to us. OK, so it is capable of representing future possibilities as far as we can tell, right? This is long before the animal actually gets to that point. And is it related to behavioral decisions, which go a little bit to Peter's point. So I'm just going to show you one example of this. What we're doing here is we're building a, mo a decoding model where we encode based on activity in these outer arms, all right? So this is a little different than what people in the place field community have done. We're not looking at all at activity that has a spatial bias on the center arm, which is called perspective and retrospective coding. We're just asking, are cells that are primarily active over here or over here being active while the animal's in the middle arm? So is it really that the animal seems to be thinking of places that are far away from it, either left or right? And we decode in every theta cycle. And this is actually important because this really makes it look like the theta cycle is the unit of consideration in this system. This is hard to see, and I apologize, but this is, say, 400 or 50 or so trials over a given day. This is the actual choice. This is the probability. All you can tell from this is they oscillate together. Um, but if you actually convert this into when you get a leftward choice, uh, sorry, a rightward choice in red, what's the sort of probability that you would have extracted that from the sum of the theta cycles? As you can see, these two are almost perfectly non-overlapping which suggests that the system is representing in a very accurate, at least ensemble way, where the animal is going to go very reliably. Now, whether this reflects a decision that's been made, whether this feeds into a decision that's going to be made, we have zero idea. That's fun to think about. But this is what we know in terms of the data. And this is consistent across all of our animals. OK, how am I doing? Do I have a few more minutes? OK, fantastic. 
So this is then we think this is actually related to behavioral decisions, but again, the causality is completely unclear. So I want to now switch to another kind of play cell behavior, which again, David alluded to, because this is really almost like a tag team kind of thing here, which is directionality. And just how do we think about representation in the brain in general, particularly if we think that some representation is of the here and now, and some representation has to do with prediction. All right, and how do we dissociate those? And the nice thing about the hippocampus is it, from our perspective, it may be telling us how to think about those. So this is a standard hippocampal place cell. This is one neuron. And what you're looking at here is all the firing, the spikes when the animal ends up going to the right, and all the spikes when the animal goes to the left. And that's just plotted here in terms of firing rate, OK? So we haven't really looked closely at these, at least in my lab. So what you see, first of all, one thing that's characteristic, there is a long tail here. We think of that as the future predictive activity. This is when the neuron is firing, and maybe this is when he's thinking about going left. <coughs> this this uh, blue activity might be, and again, please don't take this too seriously. These are all hypotheses at this point. It might be when the animal is here and thinking about going left, but actually goes right, right? So if you think about that theta alternation, some cycles you have the non-actual representation coming up. So one interpretation of this activity is not its own little place field, but is considering a possibility that doesn't happen. Again, don't take this too seriously, but just work with me for the moment. If that's true, then this activity should all occur at late phases of the theta cycle, which is at the end of those sweeps, right? It should all occur at the end of something where the animal's thinking future. And that is exactly what happens, OK? So this is, these are standard what are called phase procession plots. They're slightly counterintuitive for this purpose. But this is late phase, and this is early phase. So as the animal normally traverses the place field, First spikes come late phase. That's when the act main part of the activity is in front of the animal. And then that transitions to earlier phase firing when the animal's in the middle of the place field. And this, is, you know, this has been known for over 20 years. The point is here, we're not getting a full cycle of this in the other direction. We're only getting the part that we think might correspond to something like a possible future. All right, So it really looks like this theta phase space might be allowing us to distinguish between things that are more present versus more future-like. OK, so this is just standard. What about directional activity? So as David mentioned, cells often in a linear environment fire differently in different directions of motion. They fire more one way than the other. So here is an example where the non-preferred is this one. right? And so this is an animal coming up this way, and there's some spiking. But it fires more in that same location in the other direction. right? And you can see that from the firing rate profiles here. There's more in this right-hand trajectory than back to the left. So how do we interpret this directional firing? Is this just a little place field? Or maybe, and again, I really feel weird about saying this, is this maybe, just maybe, the animal thinking that it could turn around? OK? Now, if we're going to entertain that for a moment, what would that mean? Well, that would mean that these spikes should exclusively occur at late theta cycles where we're thinking about something future-oriented. And that's, in fact, what we see. All right, And now it's not exclusive. This is a nice example. But it's very statistically clear, and I can show you the data from all of them, that these guys in the non-preferred direction are preferentially firing late th theta cycle, which is what we have been associating with future, whereas these guys, of course, show that whole thing. And so maybe, just maybe, this is, again, that same distinction. And maybe we should think about this sort of directional firing as something where the system is maintaining a representation of possibilities at all times. Right? And from an adaptive point of view, I think it's really easy to see why that's useful. Right? It's nice to know that I can turn around and go backwards. Right? It's nice to know it likes to maintain that representational capacity at all times. So maybe this is what's going on here. OK, is this even plausible? Right? For this to be plausible, it needs to be something that's true across the population. It can't be just one neuron doing this at a time. They need to be doing it together. So the system needs to represent a coherent possibility. Now, everything I'm showing you here is very hot off the presses, um, unfinished. But here's a basic idea. Here's a bunch of play cell maps where the cell prefers left, and the right word is in the light red. Here's other cells where the prefers, cell prefers left. This is the direction of motion. Mostly, it's firing these black cells. But every once in a while, you get three red cells all firing together, as though it's a coherent representation of something that is dominant in the opposite direction. And then finally, just to finish this up, Here's an example, and I'm just going to show this. This is the decoding of direction. And what we are seeing is left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, 
and so on. In this every theta cycle decoding of which way we would guess the animal is moving from the spiking that we're seeing. All right? Now this is mostly on the late phase of theta cycles. This early phase is a mess. Right? But again, it's the same sort of idea that these representations start out where the animal is, and then they go to something, or the, you know, the future part can be, all, can be different than where the animal is. OK, um, it's significant. I'm running out of time, so I'll stop. So just in conclusion, we find frequent alternation, much more frequent than we'd expect by chance, between representations of what, we look, what look like future possibilities across data cycles. It is not limited to these vicarious trial and error behaviors where the animal is doing this. This really seems to be something we can see during directed motion, which was a huge surprise to us. Um, it seems to occur for both divergent tasks and opposite directions of travel. And you know, based on things that, again, Jim and Mike have seen, it may be something more general in the brain for representing other kinds of possibilities. We don't know. And then we don't know what causal role this is, but it it, you know, one can start telling fun stories about evidence accumulation. You can imagine that if your brain can imagine this one and then that one, then you could build up representations inside of which is better and use those to make a decision. Right? Alternately, this could just reflect some other area telling the hippocampus. We really don't know. OK. Lastly, just to acknowledge people, Kenny, as I mentioned, who really did this work and discovered this phenomena, uh, Jason Mari, who contributed, and Matthias, who collected a chunk of the data and Uri, our collaborator, who helped us, or really who developed these algorithms. Thanks. I'll let you do it, because that yeah. way. Go ahead. So is the first escape predictive of uh, what the animal behavior they choose? Because in the two examples that you show, uh, the animal at the end chose the one that the first swipe that it Yeah, we have not looked at whether the first cycle is predictive. We've looked at, on average, if we just count up the cycles, um, whether it's predictive, but we don't know yet. It's a good question. All right. So just to summarize what, what I've understood. So, so during the theta cycle, in the early phases, is represented the places where the red has been? Or Roughly where the animal is now. Is now? So early, yeah, or sorry, the first part of each theta cycle, cells are firing that are roughly corresponding, as far as we can tell, the current location. And that, is, and that is coherent. And then the second, in the late phase, we have sort of the possibility on every second cycle to represent two alternatives in, in the future. That's the idea. That's the maybe, idea, maybe, maybe, yes. Maybe, maybe. Yes, right, thank you. I really appreciate so, the maybe's. So if, you, <laughs> if you have three arm maze, sort of, uh, yeah. you would expect that maybe every third. Uh, yeah, well, so this relates to Peter's question. So, how would the brain do this if it had multiple options, right? Uh, you can imagine all sorts of ways. Right? You could systematically alternate through three. You could do relative pairs. Um, or we could be totally wrong. Right? And something else could be going on. So I don't know which of those it is. It's appealing to me to think that if this is a rhythm that is basically clocking the local cycle of processing in the brain, then anything you do has to be fit into that rhythm. And I think there's actually fairly strong evidence for that in general. So then I would think that you might have other areas say, OK, left, right, straight, straight, you know, something like that. And then maybe there's some sort of you know, uh, decay mechanism whereby a representation that's just been there is going to fall off and some else, something else will come up. But we don't know. So you should be able to, uh, to decode what the red is going to do in the future with some probability at least, right? Yes, and that's, it's, that's 70 to 100%, 99% correct, depending on which animal it is and how good the data are. And Michael, Michael. Oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, it's really interesting, and I'm curious what is the utility of it? And so if, you know, if basically, you think it might relate to planning or decision of performance. And you mentioned you record during, during learning, right? So at some point, this task becomes hippocampal independent because of the alternation. And during learning, supposedly, hippocampus is necessary. Right. You should see a change. Yeah, so we haven't quantified this as a function of learning. The challenge is that this requires enough data to be able to be really sure. And where we have enough data and the whole learning cycle, we haven't sort of tiled that space sufficiently yet. Um, what I can say at least is, in these cases, we're talking about early enough in learning that we're fairly confident that a hippocampal lesion would diminish performance, and we see this activity. But more broadly, just because the hippocampus isn't critical doesn't mean it's not usually involved, right? So, so um, you know, my, my own pet hypothesis about the utility is really that, like, how do you even know that a bifurcation point is coming up? Like, if you're, if you're on a path, how would you consider that? How would you represent that in a current location? So it's really useful to have representations that extend away from you. And then you need some way of regulating those in time so that you don't get locked into one. And so maybe this is the brain's way of doing that to maintain behavioral flexibility. But again, I'm just making stuff up. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's very cool. So I have two questions. Um, 
first, uh, following up on this idea of multiple possibilities, I mean, when you're on the, the stem of W, does that mean you expect to see four possible sequences? Because you've got two directions and two. Yes, yes. So I wish we could do that. We tried decoding all possibilities, and we don't have the data to do that comfortably. We occasionally saw things that looked like there could be both directional and future alternation, but I do not feel comfortable saying that. And we see other cells that we can't explain by either direction or future thing doing this alternation stuff. So that may be representations of stuff that we don't even know how to access. But yes, our guess is that there may be others. I just can't prove that. My other question was, um, on, just on the linear track, does this mean you end up classifying more cells as being directional? Because the bidirectional cells actually will have a, a, a real yeah. direction in it. Not, not that, that would be what I would, yeah, right, that, that would be the, so, so originally just for people's reference, on a completely novel track, cells start out largely equivalent in the two directions of motion, but within a couple of passes, they start um, switching to becoming strongly directional. And so one argument that could be made there is, in fact, they become extremely directional, but the alternative firing we're just misinterpreting as non-directional. It's actually thinking about this other possibility. How do we prove that? Right? Like, how do you actually show that that's what's going on? I think it's hard. So this is, that's why I was trying to be so careful, because I, I don't know how to prove that right now. But that's the idea. Was that a question? Sort of following along that and the other question about sort of adding arms to the maze, I wonder if, if you alternate the, if you change the reward contingencies in different parts of the maze, if you could sort of get at that. Like, if, would you expect to see, like, the, instead of the same, instead of an equivalent red, blue, red, blue, would you reduce the red, yeah. like change the pattern? Of the right, so I mean, it's interesting here. The animal knows what it's supposed to do and it's behaving very well, and yet we're still seeing this alternation, right? So on one hand, the alternation is predictive. On the other hand, it's still there, even though the animal's performing at high level. So it's certainly possible that we could bias it more one way or the other, and it's possible on the cycles that we don't see it, we're just seeing 100% because the brain already knows which way to go. So we need to, I think, introduce different kinds of uncertainty and planning to get at that, exactly what you're suggesting. And I'm wondering if this, this emergence of directionality actually has a lot to do with reward. Like, it's possible. No one has done this without reward that I know of, right? Which is sort of that related point. Which is one more question. So uh, given th that these events exist, uh, if you just naively measure place fields, does this mean that they will corrupt to some extent? Absolutely. If you do the math, is this a significant? Uh, um, yeah, so, so this is a problem, right? There's a, it, oh, sorry, there, roughly, make sure I get this right. There's a circularity in the way we evident, where we do decoding and estimate place fields, in that we take all of the spiking activity and we assume that that defines the probability distribution of spiking. And what this is suggesting is that that's wrong and that there should be some parts of the spiking, particularly, say, uh, early phase theta, which is the real place field, and then their late phase theta shouldn't even be in that. In that case, everything will become stronger. Right? Because we will have gotten rid of all of those spikes that are actually pulling the representation back when we do the decoding. We did not do that here. No, but I'm just trying to, to see if, uh, if you do an estimate based on how frequently these events are occurring, to what extent do they corrupt? Yeah, so I would say, you know, let me just go back for a moment. So I just want to show one place field. So like this thing, right? So there's a long tail here and then the peak. And so our, our guess is that, in fact, this is all corrupting. And something here is real, and we don't know where the transition is. So from that perspective, you know, yes, it will change things. The amount it changes things, I'm not totally sure, because we haven't done that. All right, okay. we should probably move on. Thanks very much, Lauren.